Sisters and brothers in Christ, good morning and grace and peace be with you all. <laughs> it is a day the Lord has made, friends. We have come here to rejoice and to be glad in it, and we are doing that very thing, even in this moment as we're talking, as we're catching up, as we are fellowshipping. This is a beautiful thing to be a part of. So welcome. Welcome to everybody who are first-time worshipers with us. Welcome to those of you who are watching and joining through the screen, whether or not you're with us right now live or whether or not you're tuning in a different day of this week to worship. Welcome, everyone. Some announcements before we continue on in worship. The first one is, I want to say, our youth got back from their week at Montreat yesterday, and I've had a, br a brief conversation with Catherine and Janet about it, and, and our adult advisors as well. They made it back, too. Everyone made it back. It was as you would expect. And for, Oh, sorry. For those of you who may not know, Montreat is a week-long retreat experience with, for the high school youth, and it is in the mountains, it is literally a mountaintop experience. I've heard it was just really fantastic and deep and beautiful, and there's gonna be a lot of things that we get to learn and take from that from our youth and, and the adults that went. Next announcement I wanna make is, Elder Randy Parrish, are you here in the room? If you are, would you raise your hand? And if you're not, that's okay too. I'm scanning, I don't see Randy, that's fine. He is our elder of the day, so, oh, all right, he's standing in the back. I wanna, I wanna say a big word of thanks to Randy, and to all of the volunteers who helped work on the fence that is around the garden. If you've not seen our church community garden, you can drive. You don't even have to walk up. You can, you can drive up. It's exactly where I'm pointing, up near US-1. They, they built a stronger fence. They put a beautiful white cross on it. They brought in these uh, like metal farm gates, heavy-duty industrial gates. And Randy did, when he helped organize the project, and for, for circumstances out of control of anyone, he had to become lead on it that he was not anticipating and shepherd this thing through for months. So thank let's give a round of applause to Randy. Everybody. <laughs> and, every, and everybody who volunteered to help make that fence possible, and to Randy's wife, who also did not anticipate <laughs> Randy running point on that. Thank you. Thank you for sharing him. Why I share this is because having a stronger fence around that garden means more produce can be grown. In your bulletin, you'll read that something like 200 tomatoes, 200 pounds of tomatoes a week get harvested from that. And it's important because it goes to people who are hungry right here in our community, filling the bellies of the food insecure. Building a fence helps protect that produce. It's a beautiful thing. Pam, I see you raising your hand. Let's do an audible. Yes, what you got? 264 pounds a week now. 264 pounds, amen, amen. So. It's, it's real ministry happening, friends. Next thing I want to share with you is before this worship concludes, prior to the benediction, we will have a congregational meeting for the simultaneously saddening but, but exciting time of officially voting to accept Pastor Rebecca's retirement. It is one of the things we have to do as PCUSA. It's part of the polity of the church. So we will vote to approve that, and then the benediction will come, then worship will conclude. So you will note that, friends. All right. Now, as we continue to approach God and worship, I invite you to join your hearts and minds with mine now in prayer. Let us pray. Creator of the world, eternal God, we've come from many places for a little while. Redeemer of humanity, God with us, we have come with all our differences seeking common ground. Spirit of unity, go between God. We have come on journeys of our own to a place where journeys meet. So here in this shelter house, we take time together and celebrate. For when paths cross and pil pilgrims gather, there is much to share and celebrate in your name, three in one God, pattern of community. Amen. Friends, I invite you now to listen with heart to our opening song. Brothers and sisters in Christ, if we say we're without sin, we are not fooling anyone. All have fallen short of God's glory. So with humility, 
Let us confess our sin before God. Loving God, you have reconciled us in Christ Jesus and have given us the ministry of reconciliation. We pray for those from whom we are estranged, bringing healing to strained or broken relationships. Forgive us for the times we have wronged others, whether by ignorance, neglect, or intention. Grant us the courage and the grace to seek their forgiveness, an opportunity to make amends. Where others have wronged us, grant us a gracious spirit that we might forgive even as we have been forgiven in Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Amen. There is so much good news, friends. There is no ranking in God's kingdom. God graces everyone with the same gifts, mercy, restoration, new life. God has kept the covenant. We have been forgiven. We have been made new people. Our purpose is clear. With God's help, we can move forward. Thanks be to God. Amen. And good morning, my friends. I would like to invite any of those who are interested in joining me down front for a minute. You do not have to be a little person. Little people are encouraged, but big people are also encouraged. So anyone who would like to join me down front for a moment, I would love to see you down here now. Come on down, don't make me talk to myself. It's never fun to talk to you. Well, yeah, it is fun to talk to yourself. Here we go. Good morning, sir. Good morning. You want to come on down? It's okay, you can go right back when you're done. Come on down. We got to chat because I got things to say. And if you know me, you know I got things. I always got things to say. Good morning, my friends. I'm so glad to see y'all this morning. Hey, let me tell you something. And good morning to those of you little fe people and big people worshiping from home with us. Here's the interesting thing. I just spent a whole week with our high school youth and I'm tired. They are amazing, but I'm tired. But here's the cool thing about it. I was sitting there thinking, what am I going to say to you guys today? And I came up with an idea of what I wanted to say to you. And then I decided to go look at the scripture that Pastor Rebecca was preaching on today. And as God would have it, God got me out of the way and my thoughts out of the way. And God helped me understand that the things that I was thinking were actually not my thoughts. They were God's thoughts because it really worked well with the scripture that Pastor Rebecca is going to preach today. And it's crazy how God does that. When we get ourselves out of the way, God kind of slips in and, and does the work that we're supposed to be doing without us even noticing. So here's what I want to do. I want to read to you just one verse of the scripture from 2 Corinthians. And if you'll look in this Bible, this is our, this is our big kid Bible. Look at how far back in the Bible I am. See, it's way back here. So this is the New Testament. We're talking about the stuff with Jesus' life and afterwards. So this is part of the New Testament. I want to read you one little verse. This plant is trying to eat me, so I'm going to push it backwards. There we go. I'm going to read you one verse, and then I'm going to tell you something very important. So are you ready? One verse from 2 Corinthians. Oops, I can't find it. Hold on. Here we go. <laughs> We, we, therefore, are Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. That's a whole lot of big words. But you know what I think it means? I think it means you are very important, and you are very important, and you are very important, and you are very important. Because at the end of the day, guess what? God created you wonderfully, exactly as you are right here and right now. And God built into this little heart that you have beating inside of you, God built in all of the love that you ever need. And the thing that I think is really cool about this scripture that Pastor Rebecca is going to talk a whole lot more about is that word reconcile. And I had to think on reconcile for a minute. And I think it means get right. So Paul, who wrote this letter in this book of 2 Corinthians, was saying, get right with God so that you can get right with one another, which means, in my thinking, 
don't forget that God put God in you and in you and in you and in you and in every single one of you. There is God down inside of us in that love that was built into those hearts that we have beating. And if we, if we hang on to that little piece of God that's inside of us and we hang on to that love because we're worried about giving too much of it away, we're not being reconciled. We're not getting right. God put that love into us to do what with it? We're supposed to give it away. We're supposed to give it away. And my friends, you are very important to this church and to this world because you have just as much love in your heart as I have in my heart. And God says, give it away. Give it away. Because you are never too little to do, do to do big things, my friends. So your job is just as important as any one of these grown-ups in the room. We are to remember that that love is right there, right sitting inside of us. And we're not supposed to hold, it on, hold on to it and worry about whether or not we have enough of it. We are to give it away. We are to reconcile by loving one another. And guess what? God put plenty in there. You're never going to run out of love. And I've come to find the more love I give away out of my heart, the more I feel it in there. And the more I realize that there's always plenty of it. There's always plenty of it. So my friends, don't ever let anybody tell you that you are not important. You are very, very important. And I can't wait to see what you do with all that love that's built into your heart and how you give it away and remind us grown-ups just how much love we have to give. All right? Deal? I'm going to work on giving my love away as much as I can if y'all will work on giving your love away as much as you can. Can we, can we pray together? Let's pray together. Then we're going to listen to Pastor Rebecca because she's going to share even more with us. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for all of the love that you built right into us. Help us remember that our job is to give it away every day and see you in every face we meet. Amen. Thank you so much for coming up here and not making me talk to myself. I love you, and I want you to give that love away every single day. And let's go back and listen to what Pastor Rebecca has to tell us, okay? Thanks, guys. On, on. That's great. Yes. And, and again, thank you for your patience for those of you who are at home and have been part of our church through this pandemic time, and, and I hope you will continue to be. Now, this is not hopeful. <laughs> Did you hear that? Was it you? No. Well, after eight years of pulling, I've worn it out. We'll, we'll have to get a new one, won't we? Yeah. Or whoever. Yeah. Okay. Go. All right. Oh, somebody's car is going off in the parking lot. <laughs> you know, we're supposed to um, thank God for whatever happens in church. And there you go. <laughs> I could hear y'all praying. Make it stop. I don't know if this is on right or not, upside down. It does? Okay. Now, is this good? That sounds pretty good. That's much better. Okay, thank you. Never a dull moment in church. Okay. The passage of Scripture today is one of my favorites. 
top 10, I'd say it truly is one of the top 10. When I went back and looked at how many times I've preached from this passage over the years. Um, but it's a new day, which means it has to be a new message, right? And I love this passage because it's new every day, like the Bible. So let us hear God's word from 2 Corinthians 5, verses 16 through 21. In your own Bibles, you should have it underlined there. I don't have much more time to tell you that. Oh, thank you. He has it highlighted on his iPad. Okay. <laughs> let us hear God's word. From now on, therefore... We regard no one from a human point of view. Even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view, we know him no longer in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us, given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their sins against them, and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. That's plural, us. So, we are ambassadors for Christ since God is making his appeal through the likes of us. And we entreat you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And this is the word of the Lord. <clears throat> Excuse me. You know, I've been working on this sermon in my mind and heart all week long. Actually, this passage has hung in my mind and soul for years, <laughs> many years. And many of you won't be surprised that it is included in, in my top 10 favorite 126 passages. And the reason it seems to always float to the top is, is just so powerful to me because it, it, it's that there is always a need in our world for reconciliation. If, if you don't think there is, you need to talk to me after the service and I'll watch the news with you. And I'm sure that preachers everywhere wonder if anyone is listening or if they really want to listen. So I, I went back, and as I was trying to figure out my top ten, and 2 Corinthians 5, it's a file all to itself, so that gave me an indication I had used it quite frequently. So I, I went through, and I kind of categorized them, and it, it was fascinating to me to see not only how many times I preached it, but what was going on in the world or in our lives that made me feel it needed to be heard. It has been, for instance, the basis of three sermons that were written the Sunday before Thanksgiving, where families come together to celebrate, but these gatherings aren't always so happy, are they? When old wounds surface and the potential for harsh encounters causes fear that creates worst-case scenarios before we even get there. And my mother used to say, you go ahead and worry. It, it, it works. But 95% of the things we worry about never happen. So <laughs> worry away. And you know she was right. Because you build up the worst case scenario, and then when you get there, it turns out to be rather pleasant. So wise woman. So um, um, I've preached this sermon, not this sermon, this, from this passage um, during every single election year going back to the mid-90s. <laughs> and this past election routine, I, I preached on it twice leading up to the election. <laughs> and y'all don't even remember that, do you? I didn't. <laughs> but mm, this is really something. I discovered I preached on this passage the week before 9-11, back in 2001. 
I use this passage again right after the Sandy Hook Elementary Massacre. 20 of the 26 were children six and seven years old. That was in December of 2012, Advent. It did not go unnoticed that uh, there was a season where we remember that unto us a child was born into a rather dark world himself, a dark world that is still with us. And I was uh, leading a Bible study in June of 2015 here at Wake Forest. And it, it was the same time, literally the same time, that down in Charleston, a white supremacist nationalist walked into a Bible study at Emmanuel AME and slaughtered him. And this text was used um, the Sunday after the massacre at First Baptist Sutherland Springs, Texas. You remember that one? 26 worshipers were shot and killed and another 20 were wounded. These still grip our hearts, you know. And this passage is still alive for us. In Christ, we, us, are handed the ministry of reconciliation, not a ministry of condemnation. Because Christ did not come into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And God is making his appeal through us to get the message out. And Paul was writing this letter to a warring church. They were at each other's throats. They were dividing up. It was like my first church during football season, and you just were wondering who was going to be mad at who the day after their team lost. It was just ridiculous. Or worse, we had so many doctors and lawyers, and the lawyers on this side of the church, where many of them were suing the doctors who were on this side of the church. <laughs> I kid you not. Wow. The Ministry of Reconciliation. We don't seem to be very good at it. Perhaps we prefer not to even consider what such a calling could really do. Hmm. It is so important. It is so relevant to, to where we are in the world today. And sometimes we wake up enough to know that this passage knows what it's talking about when it tells us that we are ambassadors for Jesus. It's a, it's a path to peace. It's, it's a, a, a reminder of the hope that is ours in Christ. It is a, guy, a gateway to freedom from oppression and from every other fear that we may harbor in our lives. And God in Christ has given us the ministry of reconciliation. We're called, every last one of us, called to be reconciled. Not, not just with our own personal divisions and families and, and friends, but reconciled with the world. Maybe, maybe it's just that it's just contrary to human nature to be deliberate in our efforts to reconcile. But then I remember the way most of us were brought up with parents who would drag us apart from warring siblings and, and say horrible things to us like, go to your room and don't even think about coming out until you can be nice to each other. <laughs> I didn't like it when she did that. And I remember that my siblings and I, we'd be separated. Oh, but we'd come out of our rooms and we'd constantly be harboring all these little jabs that we knew we had on the other and we'd push the buttons that we knew would cause sparks. And the whole effort was to make sure that the sparks flew from the sibling and we'd be set free from responsibility. But you know, y'all, we know how to be nice. We just 
choose not to be. And what does the Lord require? To do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with our God who calls us to be ambassadors for Christ, reconciling the world. Wow. Seek it. Represent it. Because we follow Christ. Who was made to be sin, who knew no sin, taking our sin upon himself, it's right there in the Bible, so that in him we might become new creations. When we get tired of all the, the awful stuff that we allow ourselves to think and to express, where's the new creation in that? Sounds like a broken record. And again and again, you know, we just revert right back to where it all began. We forget whose we are as we face this really tough world. Maybe we like to go back to that awful stuff because it's familiar, or maybe because we're really afraid that we might be responsible, or maybe we're really afraid that God might call us to account to do something about it. Maybe it's just a sense of helplessness and we don't even know where to start. You know, but our purpose remains. We're ambassadors for Christ. We carry the message that there is another way, people. But you know, that ambassador stuff, I, I don't think him ever goes around and says, oh, yes, I'm an ambassador for Jesus. Well, <laughs> she does it through her music, that, that, that gift, which is amazing. Um, no, I'm not an ambassador either. I'll tell you what I think, and often it, it cuts people off, and they don't want to have anything to do with me. Of course, y'all don't have that problem at all, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. It seems a bit daunting. It makes us feel a bit uncomfortable, you know? Uncomfortable for many reasons. I, I find myself saying, oh, man, ambassadors, what a big word. The Pope's an ambassador for Christ, okay. It's his job. That's who Paul was talking about. The Pope is the ambassador. Or, <laughs> turning the picture around from some of you all, said, well, I'm glad I'm not the preacher. They're the real ambassadors in the world. <laughs> Have you seen some of the preachers I've seen lately? <laughs> and some just refuse to explore the reasons why they want to avoid this calling that God gives to each of his children. Hmm. Yet, we are always going to be confronted with uncomfortable truths throughout our lives. Thus, Paul's encouragement and, and insistence that we be reconciled to God first and foremost. That's where we have to start if we're going to get anything right to be the new creation that is ours in Christ, to let go of all the, the old ways that destroy and suffocate and live into the new with a ministry of reconciliation. That just is a chilly bump moment for me to think of the possibilities. Or maybe the question we really wrestle with the most is the one that Jesus uh, asked of us, it, as we waddle around in a, in a rut of brokenness and insanity, it's the question he asked at the pool of Bethesda, do you want to be healed? And maybe the answer is the same we give that the man by the pool gave. <laughs> no. Jesus offers us an alternative. We just tend to forget about it. So then I was thinking, what can we do? There is a sense of the feeling that we're not qualified. We don't even know where to start. We'll probably mess things up, right? Hmm. But what if we were to wake up each day, every day, and remember our calling? 
and to think big and consider all the small ways that we can respond, the ways we are capable of doing, especially when we're backed by the powerful ways of God's Spirit moving through us. We're not called to do anything alone. We're the church. We bring all of our little small gifts together and we approach the big things and challenges that God helps us to recognize. We are a body that holds Christ at the very center of our life together above all else. So you're, you're there and you say, well, I'm still stuck back on those small actions. Can you be a little more specific, Rebecca? Well, yes, I can. I'm going to give you the top 10 things. <laughs> I love the countdown stuff, don't you? The top 10 things that you can do. Every last one of us. Okay. Wake up and remember whose you are. If you can't think of anything, I'm going to give you the answers. You can write this down if you want, but you know, nobody ever picks up that little puny pencil and writes these things down. Nobody ever listens to me, but that's okay. I'll write it down and put it in the leaflets. <laughs> but then you have to read, and I know some of you are reading challenged, but that's okay. <laughs> I have no filter. I apologize. <laughs> Take a piece of paper and write these down. Put them on your bathroom mirror so you see it every day. Or if you prefer the refrigerator door, that's okay too. All right, number one. You are a child of God. I think Miss Catherine has just turned herself blue trying to remind us of that every time she opens her mouth. And y'all, she opens her mouth a lot. Yeah. See, I no idea what's wrong with me today. Have you met Kim? Yeah. Oh, yes. I love you, too. Y'all, there's no telling what next week will bring. Okay. Number two. It's the greatest of all the steps we can take, and yes, it's possible. <laughs> love God. Love God. With all your heart and with all your soul, with all your intelligence, and your strength. Number three, love your neighbor. Why? Why in the world should I love that cuss who lives next door to us? My in-laws. <laughs> I am on a roll. I apologize ahead of time. I hope they're not watching us today. <laughs> okay. Love your neighbor. How and why? Love as God loves us. Number four, welcome the stranger, the foreigner in our midst, the refugees who no longer have a home. Love them and welcome them whether they are documented or not. Number five, Love Jesus. No, I mean really love Jesus. You know, we sing Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. How about this? We know Jesus loves us because of the Bible. But the hard question is, do we love Jesus? <laughs> love Jesus by loving the most vulnerable, the despised people in the world. We know who they are the criminals, the poor, the homeless, the thirsty, the least. Love the politician you don't even agree with. Love the vaccinated and love the unvaccinated. Love those who are dying with horrible, messy diseases and cannot breathe on their own. Love the grieving and our nation and world is blanketed with grief. Love the deniers. 
and, and especially love the medical personnel and the first responders. Oh yes, and love the atheists. Love those of, of different religions. Love the non-Christians who have gotten nothing but hatred and threats of hell in their approaches to Jesus Christ. Love the angry Christians. Love every single African American. Love every indigenous person in these United States. Love Jesus by loving those who are trapped in their own fear, the ones we so easily label undeserving, the ones who we would rather dismiss and ignore. Love Jesus, because if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation every day. You know, we live in a new era. I cannot tell you how beautiful it is to be in church with you this morning because we've missed each other so much. And we hope that this new era will be one where COVID will no longer be a catalyst that divides us or kills us. You know, things, things have by necessity had to shift and be redirected. And, and yes, they feel different. Church isn't quite the same. We can celebrate the strides made through technology that truly just went way more than we could have imagined in terms of how we can, be, how we can stay connected through technology. And, and I know that some of you were so grateful for being able to, to live stream into our worship service. And we have many in our church who, who still are, and, and I'm so glad they're doing that. But then I have to tell you a, a story, and I did not ask permission to use this, so you know who you are. <laughs> A member emailed me, almost tongue in cheek, but I think there was a little seriousness to it, how much they enjoyed being able to have communion online with the church family. And I said, yeah, yeah, that was a good experience for us too. And then I, and I said, what was it that made it so meaningful other than the fact that we were communing with one another and with God? And he said, I've always wanted to have real wine during communion. <laughs> and at home, I can use the good stuff. <laughs> he did come back when we opened up again, and it was a communion Sunday, and he, <laughs> he picked up one of those little cups that we've been using. You know, the, and you take out the little rice cake that really is more like styrofoam, and, and then you peel off the, the top, and there's what they call unfermented grape juice in it, and, and it tastes horrible and because it's been packaged for the last five years. And, and, <laughs> and we would take that little styrofoam wafer, and we'd stick it in there, and then we'd take it. <laughs> And so he did that the first Sunday, and you know I thought it was kind of cool, and all of us did it with, with joy in our hearts, I'm sure, except for my friend who said, well, until we go back to regular communion, um, I, I think I'll, I'll stay home. And <laughs> <laughs> that dog. <laughs> We isolate for a wide variety of reasons, but I can't help but wonder if the major contributing factor is that we have forgotten what it is to live in community with one another, because we're all created for relationship. That's why I'm, I'm thrilled to see all of you who are here, and for those of you who make the effort at home to be with us. It's community building. I think if we don't have enough human contact, we, we, we get a little squirrely. 
more snippy, more wild in our responses, forgetting that from the very beginning we were created for a relationship with God and with one another. It defines who we are as human beings. And what happens when we forget that our, forget our, our humanity? When we target our humanity and put aspersions upon everybody around us who doesn't think like we do? What happens? And, and, I've, and I saw a very pointed illustration this week. Of course, it came out of Florida, all the crazy people in Florida. Well, I was appalled when I read it about a Florida homeowner who was yelling at a man who was trying to save another neighbor's life after the man's car ran off the road due to a seizure. And, and the car went onto the yelling man's front lawn before it stopped and the homeowner came out and screamed, get off my lawn, get that man out of here, let him die somewhere else. I, I really pray that it speaks for itself in terms of knowing what is missing in that incident and in so many others like it. What is lacking, corroding, and undermining what it is to be human and in relationship with one another? It's the need for reconciliation with God because we have removed ourselves from the source of our salvation. Yes, church as we knew it, in many ways, um, has been altered. We're always going to have an online presence. We have people who worship in our service in several places internationally even. And, and there are some friends in Texas who I don't know except that they watch us and, and in Ohio and in Massachusetts and in California. People we never would have reached otherwise and that's going to continue. It's a gateway to a church that has rejected so many. And to think in the past tense won't get us very far. We know there's a tendency to say, oh, my, we're finally back together for who knows how long. And, and now we can go back to the way things were in 2019. And at the po this point in our church's life, Wake Forest Presbyterian, it would be counterproductive. We might feel more comfortable Part of our mission focus is shifting because the world is different. It has changed. The need to think differently is very challenging. You know, I, I've tried to put it in, into your hearts and minds, the seven deadly words of the church. You know what they are. We've never done it that way before. Well, we've done a lot of other things we've never done before, and it looks pretty good to me. But of course we don't know what we don't know. But we aren't called to simply rest in the comfortable, the way things have always been, the same old, same old. We're called to be faithful ambassadors for Christ in the world that lays beyond us. Thinking big means that the need to share and to live out our combined little actions of faith to do it together. Hmm. It's essential. So the opportunity to be the presence of, of, of God in the world is it's wide open. It's wide open to, to vibrant, more effective, more loving and creative ministry with those who truly are seeking another way especially in this era of great challenge and disruption and hostility. Oh, goodness, I, I, I'm, I'm behind. I've, I've only given five items of those ten items, right, on, on how to, to, to be ambassadors, to help us live out our purpose. Okay, well, I've got the other, other five now. Are you ready? 
through all of this loving and stuff, be reconciled to God all the time. Number seven, listen to one another and to the world. Ask questions and shut your own mouth and listen. Be the ambassador for Christ. Number nine, do one through eight. Number 10, turn off the alarm. <laughs> oh, Rebecca, okay. Number 10, this is really important. I'll tell you what it is next week. <laughs> and all God's people said, Amen. Sisters and brothers in Christ, I invite you to pray with me now. Let us pray. O Christ, we bow before you in this shelter house of prayer once more to give thanks. Together we gather, celebrating your presence and creation around us in the flowing air, the fertile earth, the summer heat. Together we gather, glad of these strong walls, which have given refuge to the broken through the years, aware of the countless prayers of joy and of suffering that have been uttered in this place. O oh Christ, you have inspired the journeying of your people from all over to this island of sanctuary and light. Grace us with your continued presence and inspire us to be a people of hospitality. O Christ, you sat at table with the betrayed and rejected. We pray for those today who do not feel welcomed in their daily lives. O Christ, you identified with the naked and with those who had no place to lay their heads. We pray for the thousands of homeless men, women, and children, old and young, in our cities. O oh Christ, you belonged to a refugee family. We pray for the millions of displaced people in our world. O oh Christ, you cared for your companions and for the little ones who surrounded you. We pray for the people you have placed in our lives, recipients of our care we give. O oh Christ, you pray that we might be one as you and the Father are one. We pray that we may feel at home with one another and with you in our midst. And teach us now, O Christ, to pray, as brothers and sisters, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Y'all, we are here just once. We get one shot at this thing called life. This is not something to be sad about. We can rejoice in this gift from God, this offering of time that God has given us. But God asks us to do something with it. God asks us to give ourselves, our whole selves, to God. Our time, not, not just our treasures, that's part of it, but, but our time, our energy, our, ourselves to build fences, to, to go on Montreat trips as youth advisors, to, to be in the joyful trenches doing ministry together. So let us now worship God with our tithes and the offerings of our lives. Till I lay my head, oh, I will. 
will sing of the goodness of God. And all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire. And in darkest nights, you are close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. And I have lived in the goodness of God. And all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Cause your goodness is running after, it's running after. surrender now I give you everything cause your goodness is running after it's running after me cause your goodness is running after it's running after me cause your goodness is running after it's running after me with my life laid pray. Gracious and loving God, just as we fill our church house with our monetary offerings, fill us with our understanding of you. Help us, assist us, guide us into reconciliation with you and with one another, and lead us out of these doors into a hurting world, knowing that we are important ambassadors of you. In the strong name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. And as we join our hearts in, in time to head our hands out to do the work of God, let us keep those hearts together with our closing song.
For those of you who are wondering, we are still in a worship service. What better time to have a congregational meeting for the purpose of dissolving the pastoral relationship between Wake Forest Presbyterian Church and me? But there's another item of business that this meeting is being called for, because after we make the dissolution of the relationship a reality, then we are going to hear from the co-chairs of the interim pastor nominating committee who have already been hard at work planning out and mapping out how we move forward from here during a time of transition, during a time of great opportunity. So I would ask that we, we've already prayed because we're in worship still, we'll keep praying. Um, Madam Clerk, I would like to recognize you, um, Sarah Kirby, if you will come forward at this point, and she will bring the official motion to the congregation. I don't know how I got the short straw, but this is the way it works around here. <laughs> I knew you were strong, no, no, woman. Nobody likes this motion, but um, I move that we, the congregation of Wake Forest Presbyterian Church, concur with the request of Rebecca. No, it's the Presbytery. That says the request of Reverend Rebecca Mall. Yeah, the and the Presbytery. Thank yeah, you. yeah, and the Presbytery. And the Presbytery. Mm -hmm. um, that the pastoral relationship between Reverend Mall and this congregation be dissolved effective August 1st, 2021. And I would say right after you'd give us number 10 of that list, because <laughs> <laughs> if you go before that, we're in trouble. It's a great one. Y'all love it. One. Yeah, yeah. Okay, you've heard the motion, it needs a second. Thank you for that. Um, is there any discussion? Don't you love the silence? Yeah, yeah, I do too. Are you ready to vote? They're all gonna vote no. <laughs> all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed like sign. Thank you. I will cry next week, not this week just to say that I just feel like the most blessed woman in the world to have served as your pastor for the last eight years. There you go. Couldn't have asked for a better church. Actually, I asked for a sick one because <laughs> I love the challenge of redemption and reconciliation, and you all are awesome. There is a second item that we are looking at today. We are here to hear a report, not to act on, but to hear a report from the Interim Pastor Nominating Committee. The co-chairs are Sharon Lineberry and Andy Dunlap, and I ask that they come forward now to give their report. I have to point out, Andy has been part of our church for over a year now. Um, he joined before he ever set foot on the campus, which is really something, isn't it? Over 30 people joined our church during the pandemic time, and slowly but surely, I'm getting to meet them in the flesh. It's kind of cool. I'm so glad you found us. Yeah. They interviewed me before they came. Hard to let go, isn't it, Rebecca? <laughs> <laughs> My wife and I have been uh, members here about five months. Um, a man is in ill health. He's talking to his wife about it, and he said, I guess when I'm gone, there'll be someone else sitting in my chair. She said, no, please don't talk like that. Don't say that. And he said, I guess there'll be someone else driving my truck. He says, no, please don't say that. Don't talk that way. And he said, I guess somebody else will be using my golf clubs. And she said, no, he's left-handed. <laughs> so, So, uh, <laughs> and I thought I didn't have any filters. In church, I mean. In church, that's right. Um, Rebecca, we don't have that someone picked out. We're working on it, though. So, um, there are many questions regarding this I, IPNC, and here are some of them plus the answers. Is the IPNC where the Wolfpack and the Hurricanes play? No. That's the PNC. This is the interim pastor nominating committee. 
pause for laughter. Okay. Um, who is on this committee? Now, this is the A team of IPNCs, and I'm going to ask them to stand. My co chair, Sharon Library, Lineberry, excuse me, uh, Don Myers, Randall Keene, and Ed Pulliam. He's out of town. Thank you. Ed's out of town. That's right. Um, so how often have y'all been meeting? We've been meeting weekly with about 20 to 2,000 emails during the week. Um, it's a really driven and efficient bunch. Um, so what is your task anyway? To find an interim senior minister to serve our church while we search for a regular full-time one. It's the book of order version of a temp. Um, and you've been meeting weekly. What have you done anyway other than wear shorts and eat chocolate? Um, we have been working on the ministry information form. It's a collection of data and narrative documents that describe who we are as a church. It also outlines what we are looking for in an interim um, pastor, and we're about 98%, would you say, Sharon? Finished? Okay. So what happens next? The document will be approved by the, section, the session and a representative from the Presbytery Committee on Ministry. Once Rebecca has officially left her position, we will upload this document to the General Assembly website where it be, will be matched with candidates for the position. We will interview candidates and select one for approval by the session. Um, once Rebecca is gone, does that mean additional work for John Fawcett? Oh, yeah. Uh, mo <laughs> most definitely, yes. Uh, he will receive support and additional compensation for his increase in duties and responsibilities. You're welcome. Um, what is one of the greatest challenges facing an interim and ultimately a regular uh, full-time minister at this church? As Rebecca said earlier, we are a church in transition, both at Wake Forest Presbyterian and the church at large. Uh, not only are we looking for pastoral leadership, uh, we are um, in a local and national community that is experiencing change in church dynamics, um, in membership, attendance, giving, and participation. We believe that with God's guidance and through prayerful service, we will find the person right for this mission of this church and right for service to our Lord. Sharon, would you like to add anything? I think you have. I think you have said it all. I appreciate that you spoke very, very well for our committee. Okay, thank you, Sharon. Any questions from the con congregation? Hearing none. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> and regarding questions that you might have during this transition period, feel free to contact the IPNC and, with any questions, and they will be more than willing to answer them as they are able. And now I ask that us let us stand and receive our closing blessing. You are ambassadors in Christ. You have been given the ministry of reconciliation constantly. Live faithfully, even as God is faithful to us. And as we go, may the peace of Christ that transcends all of our human understanding keep our hearts and our minds in the knowledge and love of Christ Jesus and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit descend upon us and wrap itself around us and fill us with his kind of peace. Amen.